I'm glad you're here. We're going to be looking at, we're going to wrap up this morning. The next two weeks will be the last two weeks of our series on 1 Corinthians. Good to see you guys again. How would you like the game? Pretty fun, wasn't it? It's a good game when we win, and it's a, bit, it's a good game when you attend, and it's a great game when both of those happen. So several of you attended, and I'm glad you did. All right, enough of football. We're in 2 Corinthians, and what I want you to do is think about the lessons that we've had on Sunday morning. Good morning. The lessons, I won't draw attention to you guys coming in a little late. Uh, The lessons that we've had so far on, on the sermon time on 2 Corinthians. But what I want to do, instead of refreshing all of that, is ask you at the very beginning, if Paul was here, physically here, What questions would you ask him? You have an opportunity to talk with the Apostle Paul. What would you ask him? And I'm not Paul. I'm going to play him later, but I'm not Paul. But I will try to answer questions that Paul, I think, would give based on everything that he wrote, including 2 Corinthians. So if you have any question at all, but particularly about 2 Corinthians. What I'm going to do is wrap everything up together in 2 Corinthians, page 1 to page 13. Is that good with you? If it's not, we'll shift gears and I'll do something else. All right? (laughs) This is what I'm prepared for. So tell me what you think. Is there any question that you would... if, If you were there in the first century, or here we are in the 21st century, and you've got all of the letters, and you've read some of them, if not all of them, What questions would you ask him? And while you're thinking of that, just let me say this. I'm going to call you and say, okay, Brian. I think the day will come when we have the opportunity to talk with the Apostle Paul. We're going to have that one-on-one opportunity with him in heaven, whatever that heaven experience is going to be. We're going to be able to, and, and I think we're going to hear him say something like this. You thought I meant what? (laughs) You you thought I said what again? Because I I think we're taking a lot of 2,000 years of interpretation and we miss a lot of what he was saying to the people at that time and the meaning that he was giving to them at that time. We take what he says and apply it to us without much exegetical work. Okay, now I've talked too much. If we can take just a moment and pray, and we'll open up for questions. Lord, this morning, as we open your word, and we open our hearts to your word and to your spirit, we pray that you will enlighten and encourage and challenge and convict. We pray that if there's things that are out of alignment with your will, that you will... um, by your spirit, work on our understanding and give us the power and uh, courage to make changes. And the things that we are doing well, I pray that you'll help us to do them even better as we walk with you and trust with you, and trust in you. We pray, Lord, that you will use us to the max. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Still have some echo. I'm hearing, I'm hearing some echo. Oh, I put in new batteries and I forgot my hearing aids. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, that, and, and it's amazing. I could even hear the ringing sound. At the, okay, what do you tell you, Rod? My personal belief is, yes, he's writing about different men and possibly the same man. We just have no clue. But I think that there's a good argument to be made that it's the same person. And whether or not it is, let's assume that it is, and he has changed. And Paul is saying, stop holding him to his past. He's been forgiven. Our issue with that is this. When we forgive people, we forgive and remember. 
We, we forgive and hold something like the scarlet letter on that person. And we might even introduce people like, you know, the Lord has really changed this person's life, but let me tell you what he was once like or what she was once like, and we hold them to their past. And we may not say those words, but sometimes our nonverbal might communicate this distance that we still have with someone that we hold them to the past. Does that make sense? Because sometimes we do that, and Paul is saying in that you embrace him because if you don't, you're allowing there to be an opportunity for Satan to come in and pull him back away from you. Okay, you, you took care of this by disfellowshipping. By the way, excommunication is different than disfellowship. Excommunication is a belief within the Catholic structure that once you've been kicked out, you can't come back. Disfellowshipping is for the purpose of bringing someone back into fellowship with the Lord and with the church. Does that make sense? So when they do come in, it's a for complete forgiveness, just as Jesus. When, when you repent, has anybody, let me ask you this way, has anyone sinned after you were baptized? Let me see your hands. Hold them up high. And this isn't something we're proud of, but it is something that, well, I think Paul would say this is something we would brag about because this is a sign of our weakness and our desperate need for the power, grace, mercy of the Lord. All right? So we would, I'm going to call you just a second. Um, so we would be wise to say, yes, we have sinned. When Jesus forgives our sin, does he remember it against you any longer? Does he treat you as a stepchild? Does he have a series of steps that once you've gone through that, then, then he'll fully accept you based upon your obedience? Or does he accept you in your dead surrender and trust, please forgive me, and then he empowers you to live and you trust him to continue, but he accepts you full and clean. That, that latter part, right? That was in ABC, and you, if you chose C, you passed this quiz so far. First John chapter seven, or chapter one, verse seven, is probably still in your Bible. If we walk in the light, the way he is in the light, the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us from all sin. If we confess, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a double cleansing. Forgiving, and he works in us to desire to do what's right. He fully accepts as if it were the day that you were born, as if it were the day you were born again. God now treats you as if you're Jesus himself. He doesn't hold anything against you. And it's not based upon your perfect obedience, because none of us have. And it's not based upon your perfect knowledge, because none of us have. And it's not based upon your perfect, even your perfect attitude, for none of us have. It's based upon your deadness and your willingness to accept his forgiveness and move on. You have a question or comment. So in, in regards to uh, not uh, either introducing somebody uh, or this guy sinned so much that... Whatever. Remember, I have my, my hearing aids off, so help me out. So in, <laughs> in regards to... I think part of it is because we've allowed the, the satanic to have foothold in us and convince us that there are some sins that are worse than others and that we're not nearly as bad as the one who. So I may have killed several people in my own heart when I hated them, but I never pulled the trigger. I'm not the one that stepped into bowling alley. I'm not the one who dropped the bomb. I'm not the one who, you know, raped and pillaged. I'm not that bad. Well, it is the I'm not that bad mentality that gets us to distinguish between people. I think part of that. There are consequences that are different, but what's that? You still have a thought. I still have a thought? The thought process, you didn't pull the trigger. You sure thought about it. Absolutely. And that's the point. And thinking, having the desire is not in and of itself wrong, but choosing to call that person in your own heart, I don't care if he lives or dies, 
you've chosen to hate. So in your heart, you have, you've called him a what? He's a zero, right? A complete zero. No value. So what have you done? You've, you've killed him? Yeah. A little louder. Yeah, I wonder about that. Because there are differences in levels of good work, and there's levels of, of sin as well. You say all sin separates. I agree with that. But I don't think all sin is necessarily equal in its rebelliousness. I, just, I wonder. I'm not sure yet. I, I'm still, can I say the jury's still out? Because the Bible doesn't clearly say that, what, what we're saying. And I grew up with a heritage. We speak where the Bible speaks. We won't call Bible things by Bible names. And if it doesn't clearly say that, I've got to say, well, my understanding is, yes, I think God treats all sin. Because any sin that I do is a falling short of the will of God. Either I have done what he told me not to do, or I have not done what he told me to do. Either one is falling short. And the word hamartia is, a, is an archery term. And Paul would say, I use that purposefully. You're aiming for the bullseye, but you missed it. Well, some people don't even aim at the target. Are they going to hit the target? No, they fell way short, right? So in their falling short, they not only didn't aim, they weren't even trying to aim. Is there a greater consequence for that? Yeah. Is there a greater guilt for that? No. God will hold us all guilty. And the consequences are going to be a lot different. Right. Yes. We as humans say, well, first degree, second degree, third degree. Well, he did that in the Old Testament too, didn't he? Huh? He did that in the Old Testament too, didn't he? He said, you know, self-defense is killing, but it, it falls into a different category of killing. It wouldn't fall into a category of murder. Well, it gets to be a play on words. Right. We do play words. You're right. And, yeah. Yeah. And he, something that my mother has said for ever since I was little was... You like to argue about everything. So as soon as I hear somebody say something, I look at, what could the opposite of that be? <laughs> and I try to, she said, you're going to argue with God. When he said, it's your time, you're going to say, no, it's not. <laughs> so I saw a hand over where? Yeah, I know Megan did, but I saw a hand before Megan. Was that you, Fred? We, we think we sin because of the consequences? No, I say we, we distinguish between how severe the sin is based on... Based on consequence. If I think something evil... Yes. That's not so bad as following through doing something evil. Well, and that, yeah, the consequence would be true, right? It's not so bad. But if I've murdered the person in my heart, the consequence Jesus said is the same. Because the intent of the law... Is not to keep our behavior pure, it's to keep our heart pure. So if you have a pure heart, you'll, you'll have pure behaviors. Because words and behaviors, Jesus said, come out of where? The heart. the heart. And so we've got to work on the heart issue. The Holy Spirit of God comes on the inside to work his way out, not on the outside to work his way in. He's more interested, he's more interested in our heart than he is in our behavior. Now, is he interested in our behavior? Absolutely. Because behaviors have consequences. But our heart is the base from which the behavior flows. Does that come close to what you were going to say, Megan? I saw you nod your head. Yeah, kind of. Okay. Let's say. There's also kind of a difference, too, in, in the temptation versus, you know, the cherishing the fighting. It's one thing to hear the temptation knocking at the door, peek around the curtain, leave the door closed and go away, rather than opening it up, opening your heart up, inviting the temptation in, making it a cup of coffee, and that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why don't you, I want to live with you for a little while, yeah. And, and there is, that, thank you, because James chapter 1, now I know Paul was not answering this question, James is, but James chapter 1 says that, right? It says desire, people are, are tempted by their own desires. Are you with me so far? 
James chapter 1, verse 13, if you're checking me out. Am I right on it? Thank you. <laughs> so in that it says, you have the desire, and when that's conceived, it gives birth to sin. Now, some have suggested that he's talking about the sexual temptation there because of the analogy, very specifically. And uh, I, I don't know that he is, but it's an interesting argument to make. But you conceive this, the desire, that is, you've chosen to live with the desire. Is the desire to do wrong, wrong? Is the desire sin? What? Is the desire sin? Can you, can you define the word temptation without using the word desire? Well, I've gotten in some knockdown drag outs about this question, so I'm interested, <laughs> I'm interested to hear what your answer is, because I'll take you to task. All right, what do you say? <laughs> say it again now. But not. What we do with that temptation is Okay. I have to say that it has to be true because it seems to me Hebrews chapter 2 says something like that. Chapters 2 through chapter 4, pages 2 and 4 to Hebrews says those very things. Who was it that was tempted like we are in every way, yet without sin? Now, how can you be tempted and not have the desire? Well, I don't think Jesus had a real desire to do something wrong. Then he wasn't tempted. I'm not tempted in areas that I don't have a desire. There are some things that are sinful I have zero desire for. <laughs> Does that make sense? So I'm not tempted in that area because I have no desire. But in the areas that are sinful and I have a desire. Now, are there areas that I'm tempted to do that are good? That comes from the spirit, right? And in fact, Galatians 5 says the spirit lusts, that is desires, against the flesh. And the flesh lusts, King James, lusteth, lusts against the spirit. There's a war going on in my body. Yes, sir. After all, he's God. Come on. He had the edge. Years ago, um, 1995, I was studying with a, a man in Estonia, um, and we were reading the passage about Jesus being temp tempted in the wilderness in, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and after we read through it and talked about it a little bit, he said he had a question. He said, uh, why did, I don't understand why Jesus allowed Satan to have so much influence over him. And that, yeah, that threw me for a loop. He obviously didn't understand what he was reading. And so he, I asked him to explain, and he pointed out how uh, Jesus, uh, how, how Satan um, led Jesus up to the top of a mountain, um, and how he led him up to the top of the temple. Why did Jesus allow him to do that? And I was stumped by that question for several years. Yes, that's a good question, isn't it? Well, yeah. Should embrace that. Yes. Jesus allowed Satan to lead him to the top of the temple. There was a real temptation here. Here's it was a desire for him to actually cast himself down as a desire to some degree for him to shortcut or do whatever it was to kneel and worship, mm -hmm. or there was no temptation. That's right. We have to accept the basis of the definition of the term. But also, this is what's really striking to me. Mark says the Spirit of God drove him into the wilderness in order to be tempted. In order to be. And I know the word tempted can be translated tested or tried. Every temptation is a trial. Every temptation is a test. And every test is a temptation. So those words... Or they, they overlap, those definitions, have here and then over here. So with that, um, okay, yes, Jesus was led out of the wilderness of those three temptations, but the, the scriptures kind of...
kind of a little bare on what that temptation actually was. Okay. Okay. He was taken to the top of the temple, and you know, if you bow down in, in, in the temple, temple, right? Yeah. <clears throat> was the temptation to go ahead and just accede to that then, or was that if I do this, if I bow down and worship him, or if I accept the world as my gift, I don't have to die really horribly in about another three years or so? Yes, and he's and that's depending on an interpretation of what Satan thought he was going to accomplish as opposed to what Jesus knew he was going to accomplish. But I do think there was a desire in there that he wrestled with, or there is no temptation. By definition of the word, it's impossible to be tempted in an area you have no desire. Mike? First Corinthians 10 tells us we will be tempted. Absolutely. A way to escape, and then the last phrase, sometimes we forget, so we can endure it. Which means the temptation isn't necessarily going to be gone. It's just that he's going to give me the ability to handle it differently. If, if then, I understand that principle. So Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 is written to instruct us when we're faced with the temptation, realize, number one, it's not coming from God. But God could take it away. <clears throat> if God... If it says that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear, does that mean, I don't mean to ignore you orphans over here, does that mean <laughs> I'm right-handed, so I tend to go this way? By the way, I watch for speakers, and the speakers, the teachers who tend to go this way more, they're probably right-handed. The teachers who look at this side, they're probably left-handed. So I'm a little more right-handed than I'm left, and I'm certainly not ambidextrous. So let me, let me finish. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Because uh, even the NIV, which you showed me, the book of Romans, say here in the King James. Yeah, say it a little, little louder, say it back here. Because I, I know if I'm having a struggle there. Paying attention to the translation. Translation, so that NI, even the NIV doesn't make the devil away. It says he took it. Yeah. American Standard, New American Standard, 1985, probably one of the closest to the. Uh, Especially when you're working with those that are not familiar with the word, using the easy English translation, the New Living Word, all of those have been changed to our new English, to our new desires of how we want it to be interpreted. I mean, they change <coughs> homosexuality. Um, those and, and rewritten what is going on in the yes. plot and stuff, and it takes some of that out and makes an easy. So the and devil if took him, but the... If you're leaving, then yes. he would have had to follow spiritually and miraculously to put himself up there versus the devil went, all right, we're sitting on top of the temple. Okay, and, and, and perhaps it was a visionary kind of experience, however, however he took him. That really changes that conversation really quick based on that one word. That one word, the devil took him. Because now, that would make you have that thought. But, but look, look back at Mark... Look back at Mark 1 where it says the spirit drove him. And the word drive is the same word that is used when Jesus drove the demons out of people. It's the same term. He, the spirit of God drove him into the wilderness in order to be tempted or tried, tested by the devil. And so the spirit is driving him here. And then the devil during that 40 day period or close to the end of it took him there, whatever that means. Physically took or mentally, you know, miraculously. And you said even the NIV. I would say especially the NIV in its translation because the translators are coming from more of a Calvinistic perspective and that shows through the translation. You want some evidence of that, I'd be happy to give you. Well, we ought to go back to the King James. Well, then you need a translation for the translation. You need a good dictionary. Probably the two best translations today in uh, the New American Standard of 1995 and the English Standard Version. 
which is what I personally use. But then if you have four or five really good translations, it's almost like having the Greek. So I would always compare. And then if you can, go back and look at the Greek because we have enough tools available for you to do that. Yes, in the, in the New Testament, Hebrew and the Old. Yeah. I'm going to preface my question with I am a sinner. You're what now? I'm a sinner. I mess up all the time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's okay. a Yes. Okay. How long do you sit with the sinners before your life starts to change and you're sinning too? How, how do you... I don't know. That's that question of good, bad companions corrupt good morals. Yes. But how long do you stay with people and associate with them in order to reach them to, with the gospel? So your purpose in being with is I want them to see Jesus and experience Jesus and I'll be with them there where they are. So, look, don't be judgmental if I've got a friend and I'm sitting in the bar with them because I'm, I'm there where they live and that's what they accused Jesus of. In fact, he drank with them enough that they accused him of being a drunkard. Did he ever get drunk? Well, we know he didn't because he never sinned, Right? Okay, so, and, and he ate enough to where they accused him of being a glutton. Now, John the Baptist, they accused him of being demon-possessed because <laughs> he didn't do either one. And, and Jesus used the sand and says, you guys can't be happy with either of us. <laughs> Liz. Okay, yeah, the, the tightness of the relationship is going to have a lot to do with the answer, and that's an individual decision that I don't think anybody outside can make that, but you've got to be careful of your own. And especially, Galatians 6 is a principle for that, verse 1. It's someone who is caught in a temptation or caught in a, in a sin, in a trespass, I think it says, that those of you who are spiritual, mature, work with that person, Bring them back, but be careful lest you're tempted. Yes, sir. What I can tell you uh, from having even recently dealt with uh, this is that you are grounded in your faith, in the word, and that you show them love by not leaving them in and out of trouble. Now, that does not mean that you partake in their lifestyle. It does not mean, in fact, you, you be scriptural about why you're not. Yes. Showing some love uh, and, and usually how it works is that God is giving you salvation from your sins that you committed very much like the sins that those that you are mentoring have committed that he has strengthened you, not you. His strength is in you so that you can go into that situation and preach. Thank you. You, you just brought to memory something that Mike said, and I want to make sure I, I take two ideas together and marry them and see what child comes out of this relationship. Okay? Look at Hebrews chapter 5 real fast with me. Would you everybody have your Bible? Digital or paper? Anybody have, not have a Bible? Hebrews. So if you look back to the, uh, close to the, old, uh, to the end of the Bible in Revelation, turn back about four, five, six books. Hebrews. It's a long letter. Chapter 5. The Hebrew writer is making an argument that Jesus was weak, and that's what qualifies him to be our high priest. <clears throat> Number one qualification of a high priest, got to be a human being who's weak. All right? He's weak, and that qualifies him. The second thing that qualifies him as a high priest is he's after the order of Melchizedek, not from the lineage of Levi which means he wasn't in the birth order of the Levitical priesthood, of the Israeli priesthood. He's above that because he was raised from the dead and there is no end to his life. And as far as we know, Melchizedek never was born and never did die. He just suddenly appeared. And to the Jewish mind, that means he's always been there. 
So based on the order of Melchizedek, both the human being and in, in weakness, but notice verse 7. Verse 7 is what will help set you free because you will relate to Jesus more here. And Megan, it will answer your question more directly than I can. And I think the Hebrew writer probably had an extremely close relationship with the Apostle Paul because his writing in some places are very similar to Paul's and yet strikingly different. Number one. Number two, I believe that it was probably Apollos. It doesn't matter, but I just I believe it is because it's Alexandrian, Alexandrian flavored Greek. All right, but <laughs> does that impress anybody here? That's what I'm trying to do. It's just to impress you with that, okay? Because it really doesn't matter. Verse seven. Here we go. In the days of his flesh, about whom are we speaking? Jesus. In the days of his flesh. In fact, it says it. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. What does prayer mean? I pray thee. What does prayer mean? It's a three-letter word. begins with an A, ends with a K, and has an S in the middle. Yeah, it just simply means ask. Prayers. What is supplication? A little louder. It, it involves repeating. Begging. Supplicating is begging. So Jesus does this. In the days of his flesh, in his weakness, he continually, the word there offered is the, he continually did this in the past. He offered up asking and beggings with loud cries and tears. To him who is able to save him from death. And he was heard, and again I'm going to say he was always heard because of his reverence, his fear of God, his relationship with God. Here's what I want you to see. Jesus faced temptation begging God for the power to overcome. The attitude in which you're going to spend time with these friends who are not walking with the Lord, they're in the world. And, and you're there, I think is going to have to be a reflection of this to keep you from falling into what it is that they are. You beg God. And how did he do it? With loud cries and tears. My friend, this is more than just Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the ultimate time. But all through, he, he went off often to be by himself and to pray. I think it's more than just, Lord, bless me today. And, and be with the people I'm going to speak with. I think he was begging God for the power to be able to face the temptation and stay pure in heart, in mind, and in action. Does that make sense? That's what this passage says to me. Well, what about Matthew chapter 5 that says a man looks at a woman to lust. He's committed adultery in his heart. I think we dealt with that, but let me deal with it real briefly. The man or the woman who looks at the other in order to lust. The intention of the looking is the problem, not the desire itself. The desire itself is not sin. God made you that way. The desire itself is not sin. The intention of the heart looking in order to lust is what Jesus is condemning there. And you go back and look at the translation, and you'll see even the NIV says lustfully, looks at lustfully. That is the intention of the heart, is to look in order to have the desire. Therefore, you have conceived, and it gives birth to that sin. I've, you've had your hand up for a long time, and I just kept going on and on and on because I thought maybe the second bell would ring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Several points. You brought up. Yes. Yes. Second of all, it is about reception of the message. You think about the gospel in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I believe. The apostles were told, you know, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Sometimes that's a very hard decision to make. A lot of times we let pride get in our way. Yes. Humbling ourselves with that prayer and supplication should put us in the proper position to know. 
That's powerful. And to take the principle, what he said to the apostles when they went to the cities, shake the dust, the principle applies. And you're right, it is difficult. I had a fellow that became friends of ours when he was a student at Utah State University. He came to our house every Sunday. He was as far away from the Lord as you could possibly be at that point in his life. He moved back to Boston. His dad died. I flew out to Boston to be with him for his dad's funeral. We became good friends through the years, kept in contact. This year, he was immersed into Christ. He's married and has three kids. 20 years. 20 years. Last Saturday, not yesterday, but last week, a fellow that Hans has known 30 years, 20 years. You've known him for how long? 20 years? Okay, so he met him when he was nine. So he, Hans knew, has known a guy for 20 years, and they've just in the last few years reconnected, working side by side, and he has been working with him to know who Jesus is and to respond to him. He also wanted, studied with the man's daughter on that morning, Saturday, that afternoon rather. He, well, that morning, I guess, the, the, uh, the young girl decides she wanted to be baptized. When they arrived from Olathe, they drove from Olathe. Yeah, and then back. So they came here specifically so Hans could talk with and baptize this young girl. And he, the dad, after this long, said, I want to be a Christian too. And so Hans had a double baptism Sunday, which I think is phenomenal because I've been in churches for years and years and years and have, have one of the shepherds still study with somebody who's not a Christian and bring them to the Lord. You guys, this church family is unique because this eldership is more interested in reaching people and growing people spiritually than they are in the physical mundane things of the, of the world, of the, of the church, put it that way. This is a unique situation. And I'm not saying that to butter up. Yes? I think you may have just answered my question. Well, good. You don't have to ask again. That's good. No. <laughs> good. Right. Yes. And the ones who continue to deliberately live in a rebellious nature against God, Paul said, don't have anything to do with them. Mark them and have nothing to do with them, and hopefully they'll come back. To the ones in the world, you keep loving and bringing the message of Jesus consistently and be a part of that person's life the most you can. And there may be a time where you have to dust off and move on. No, ma'am. I have not seen... I've only been in two churches where they've actually done something like that. Now, I, I have been where they've gone through the Matthew 18 process of going one-on-one -on -one and then witnesses, and the person's come back. But I've not seen... That there was one that it caused such a problem in the church, they asked the family to no longer come until they changed their attitudes because the whole family was, was guilty of causing dissension in a small church to the point that it, it, it was really horrendous. And it, every day of the week, 5.30 in the morning, I was waking up throwing up. It was so stressful. Yeah. Hey, well, they in most cases, they've already withdrawn fellowship. They just stop coming all together. They, they feel guilty or whatever. Uh, and this is, a, this is for a different class time that maybe we'll have. Was this a beneficial time? I just didn't want to waste 45 minutes with you spending, you know, shooting the breeze. But I hope that what you have are some tools to help you face the week in a different way, a different understanding, an inspiration, a challenge, a conviction. And so we're done. <laughs>